Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Sleep and Relax ASMR. Today, um, I'll be reading some Japanese fairy tales. I found them through a site I think called feedbooks.com. Um, the author, well the translator I suppose is Yi Fiodora Ozaki, uh, who was an early 20th century translator of Japanese short stories and fairy tales. And her translations were fairly liberal, but have um, been uh, popular. Were reprinted several times after her death. Uh, this comes from <clears throat> the um, preface and the uh, or the preface in the book. So anyway, I mean, it's a series of short Japanese um, stories or fairy tales, whatever you want to call them. Um, I don't speak Japanese, so some of these names that I say are probably not going to be properly um, properly read. Bear with me. I just figured it'd be a nice, um, you know, a nice episode to make. Hear some short stories together and uh, and um, kind of expand the uh, catalog of episodes available on the podcast. First short story is titled, My Lord Bag of Rice. Long, long ago there lived, in Japan, a brave warrior known to all as Tawara Toda, or My Lord Bag of Rice. His true name was Fujiwara Hidesato, and there's a very inter interesting story of how he came to change his name. One day he sallied forth in search of adventures, for he had the nature of a warrior and could not bear to be idle. So he buckled on his two swords, took his huge bow, much taller than himself, in his hand, and slinging his quiver on his back started out. He had not gone far when he came to the bridge of Seta no Karashi, spanning one end to the beautiful Lake Biwa. No sooner had he set foot on the bridge than he saw lying right across his path a huge serpent dragon. Its body was so big that it looked like the trunk of a large pine tree, and it took up the whole width of the bridge. One of its huge claws rested on the parapet of one side of the bridge while its tail lay right against the other. The monster seemed to be asleep, and as it breathed, fire and smoke came out from its nostrils. At first, Hidesato could not help feeling alarmed at the sight of this horrible reptile lying in his path, for he must either turn back or walk right over its body. He was a brave man, however, and putting aside all fear went forward dauntlessly. Crunch, crunch. He set now on the dragon's body several, several, t on the dragon's body now between its coils, and without even one glance backwards, he went on his way. He had only gone a few steps when he heard someone calling him from behind. On turning back, he was much surprised to see that the monster dragon had entirely disappeared, and in its place was a strange looking man who was bowing most ceremoniously to the ground. His red hair streamed from over his shoulders and was surmounted by a crown in the shape of a dragon's head, and his sea-green dress was patterned with shells. Hidesato knew at once that this was no ordinary mortal, and he wondered uh, much of the strange occurrence. Where had the dragon gone in such a short space of time? Or had transformed himself into this man, and what did the whole thing mean? While these thoughts passed through his mind, he had come up to the man on the bridge and now addressed him. Was it you that just called me now? Yes, it was I, answered the man. I have an earnest request to make of you. Do you think you can grant it to me? If it is in my power to do so, I will, answered Hidesato. But first, tell me who you are. I am the Dragon King of the Lake, and my home is in these waters just under the bridge. And what is it you have to ask of me? said Hidesato. I want you to kill my mortal enemy, the centipede who lives in the mountain beyond, and the Dragon King pointed to a high peak on the opposite shore of the lake. I have lived now for many years in this lake, and I have a large family of children and grandchildren. For some time past we have lived in terror, for a monster centipede has discovered our home, and night after night it comes and carries off one of my family. I am powerless to save them. If it goes on much longer like this, not only shall I lose all my children, but I myself must fall victim to the monster. I am, therefore, very unhappy, and in my extremity... And in my extremity, I determined to ask the help of a human being. For many days, with the intention of 
For many days with this intention, I have waited on this bridge in the shape of this horrible serpent dragon that you saw, in the hope that some strong, brave man will come along. But all who came this way, as soon as they saw me, were terrified and ran away as fast as they could. You are the first man I have found able to walk, to look at me without fear, so I knew at once you were a man of great courage. I beg you, have pity upon me. Will you not help me and kill my enemy, the centipede? Hidesato felt very sorry for the Dragon King on hearing his story, and readily promised to do what he could to help him. The warrior asked where the centipede lived, so that he might attack the creature at once. The Dragon King replied that his home was on the mountain Mikami, but that as it came every night a certain hour to the place of the lake, it would be better to wait till then. So Hidesato was conducted to the palace of the Dragon King under the bridge. Strange to say, as he followed his host downwards, the waters parted to let them pass, and his clothes did not even feel damp as he passed through the flood. Never had Hidesato seen anything so beautiful as this place built of white marble beneath the lake. <clears throat> Excuse me, well. He had often heard of the Sea King's Palace at the bottom of the sea, where all the servants and retainers were saltwater fishes, but here was a magnificent building in the heart of Lake Biwa. The dainty goldfishes, red carp, and silvery trout waited upon the Dragon King and his guest. Hidesato was astonished at the feast that was spread for him. The dishes were crystallized lotus leaves and flowers, and the chopsticks were of the rarest ebony. As soon as they sat down, the sliding doors opened and ten lovely goldfish dancers came out, and behind them followed ten red carp musicians, with the koto and the samisen. Thus the hours flew by till midnight, and the beautiful music and dancing had banished all thoughts, had banished all thoughts of the centipede. The Dragon King was about to pledge the warrior in a fresh cup of wine. Was about to pledge yeah. Was about to pledge the warrior in a fresh cup of wine when the palace was suddenly shaken by a tramp tramp, as if a mighty army had begun to march not far away. Hidesato and his host both rose to their feet and rushed to the balcony and the warriors saw on the opposite mountain two great balls of glowing fire coming nearer and nearer. The dragon king stood by the warrior's side, trembling with fear. The centipede. Those two balls of fire are its eyes. It is coming for its prey. Now it is time to kill it. Hidesato looked where his host pointed, and in the dim light of the starlit evening, behind the two balls of fire he saw the long body of an enormous centipede winding round the mountains, and the light in its hundred feet glowed like so many distant lanterns moving slowly towards the shore. Hidesato showed not the least sign of fear. He tried to calm the Dragon King. Don't be afraid. I shall surely kill the centipede. Just bring me my bow and arrows. The Dragon King did as he was bid, and the warrior noticed that he had only three arrows left in his quiver. He took the bow, and fitting an arrow to the notch, took careful aim and let fly. The arrow hit the centipede right in the middle of its head, but instead of penetrating, it glanced off harmless and fell to the ground. Nothing daunted, he decided to took another draw, fitted it to the notch of the bow, and let it fly. Again, the arrow hit the mark. It struck the centipede right in the middle of its head, only to glance off and fall to the ground. The centipede was invulnerable to weapons. When the Dragon King saw that, even his brave warrior's arrows were powerless to kill the centipede, he lost heart and began to tremble with fear. The warrior saw that he had now only one arrow left in his quiver, and, if this one failed, he could not kill the centipede. He looked across the waters. The huge reptile had wound its horrid body seven times around the mountain and would soon come down to the lake. Nearer and nearer gleamed fireballs of eyes, and the light of its hundred feet began to throw reflections of the, in the still waters of the lake. Then suddenly the warriors remembered that he had heard that human saliva was deadly to centipedes. But this was no ordinary centipede. This was so monstrous that even to think of such a creature made one creep with horror. Hidesato determined to try this, his last chance. Hidesato was determined to try his last chance. So taking his last arrow and first putting it, the end of it in his mouth, he fitted the notch to his bow to careful aim once more and let fly. This time the arrow hit again the centipede right in the middle of the head, but instead of glancing off harmlessly as before, it struck home to the creature's brain. Then, with a convulsive shudder, the serpentine body stopped moving, and the fiery light of its great eyes and hundred feet darkened to a dull glare like the sunset of a stormy day. And then, excuse me, and then went out in blackness. Sorry, adjusting a little studio here. 
A great darkness now overspread the heavens. The thunder rolled and the lightning flashed and the wind roared in fury, and it seemed as if the world were coming to an end. The dragon king and his children and retainers all crouched in different parts of the palace, frightened to death, for the building was shaken to its foundation. At last the dreadful night was over. Day dawned beautiful and clear. The centipede was gone from the mountains. Then he decided to call to the dragon king to come out with him to the balcony, for the centipede was dead and he had nothing more to fear. Then all the inhabitants, inhabitants of the palace came out with joy and he decided to point to the lake. There lay the body of the dead centipede floating on the water, which was dyed red with its blood. The gratitude of the dragon king knew no bounds. The whole family came and bowed down before the warrior, calling him the preserver and the bravest warrior in all of Japan. Another feast was prepared, more sumptuous than the first. All kinds of fish, prepared in every imaginable way, raw, stewed, boiled, and to roasted, served on coral trays and crystal dishes were put before him, and the wine was the best that Hidesato had ever tasted in his life. To add to the beauty of everything, the sun shone brightly, the lake glittered like a liquid diamond, and the palace was a thousand times more beautiful by day than by night. <clears throat> His host tried to persuade the warrior to stay a few days, but he decided to insist on going home, saying that he had now finished what he had come to do and must return. <clears throat> The Dragon King and his family were all very sorry to have him leave so soon, but since he would go, they begged him to accept a few small presents, so they said, in token of their gratitude to him for delivering them forever from their horrible enemy, the Centipede. As the warrior stood in the porch taking leave, a, taking leave, a train of fish was suddenly transformed into a retinue of men, all wearing ceremonial robes and dragon's crowns on their heads to show that they were servants of their great Dragon King. The presents they carried were as follows. First, a large bronze bell. Second, a bag of rice. Third, a roll of silk. Fourth, a cooking pot. Fifth, a bell. He decided to not want to accept all these presents, but as the Dragon King insisted, he could not well refuse. The Dragon King himself accompanied the warrior as far as the bridge and then took leave of him with many bows and good wishes, leaving the procession of servants to accompany He decided to his house with his presents. The warrior's household and servants. Yeah, the warrior's household and servants had been very much concerned when they found that they did not return the night before, but they finally concluded that he had been kept by the violent storm and had taken shelter somewhere. When the servants on the water, when the servants on the watch for his return caught sight of him, they called to everyone that he was approaching, and the whole household turned out to meet him, wondering much what the retinue of men bearing presents and banners that followed him could mean. As soon as the Dragon King's retainers had put down the presents, they vanished, and Hidesato told all what had happened to him. <clears throat> the presents, which he had received from the grateful Dragon King, were found to be of magic power. The bell only was ordinary, and as Hidesato had no use for it, presented it to the temple nearby, where it was hung up to boom out the hour of day over the surrounding neighborhood. The single bag of rice, however, much was taken from a day after day for the meals of the night and his whole family. Never grew less. The supply in the bag was inexhaustible. The roll of silk, too, never grew shorter, though time after time long pieces were cut off to make the warrior a new suit of clothes to go to court in the new year. The cooking pot was wonderful, too. No matter what was put into it, it cooked deliciously whatever was wanted without any firing. Truly a very economical saucepan. The fame of Hidesato's fortune spread far and wide, and as there was no need for him to spend money or on rice or silk or firing, he became very rich and prosperous, and was henceforth known as my Lord Bag of Rice. That was a nice little uh, short story. Uh, I'm seeing what the next one is on here. couple here but it's kind of like poorly laid out here uh, 
Um, let's do this one. The Mirror of Matsuyama, a story of old Japan. Long years ago in old Japan, there lived in the province of Echigo, a very remote part of Japan, even in these days, a man and his wife. When this story begins, they had been married for some years and were blessed with one little daughter. She was the joy and pride of both their lives, and in her they stored an endless source of happiness from their old age. What golden letter days in their memory were these that had marked her growing up from babyhood. The visit to the temple when she was just 30 days old, her proud mother carrying her robed in ceremonial kimono to be put under the patronage of the family's household god, then her first dolls festival, which her parents gave her a set of dolls and their miniature belongings to be added to as year succeeded year. And perhaps the most important occasion of all, on her third birthday, when her first obi, broad brocade sash, of scarlet and gold was tied round her small waist, a sign that she had crossed the threshold of girlhood and left infancy behind. Now that she was seven years of age, she had learned to talk and to wait upon her parents in those several little ways so dear to the heart of fond parents, their cup of happiness seemed full. There could not be found in the whole of the island empire a happier little family. One day there was much excitement in the home, for the father had been suddenly summoned to the capital on business. In these days of railways and... I don't even know what that word is... And other rapid modes of traveling, it is difficult to realize what such a journey as that from Matsuyama to Kyoto meant. The roads were rough and bad, and ordinary people had to walk every step of the way, whether the distance were one hundred or several hundred miles. Indeed, in those days, it was a great undertaking to go to the capital, <clears throat> excuse me, as it is for a Japanese man, as a Japanese to make a voyage to Europe now. So the wife was very anxious while she helped her husband get ready for the long journey, knowing what an arduous task lay before him. Vainly, she wished that she could accompany him, but the distance was too great for the mother and child to go, and besides that, it was the wife's duty to take care of the home. All was ready at last, and the husband stood in the porch with his little family round him. Do not be anxious, I will be back soon, said the man. While I am away, take care of everything, especially of our little daughter. Yes, we shall be all right, but you... You must take care of yourself and delay not a day in coming back to us, said the wife, while the tears fell like rain from her eyes. The little girl was the only one to smile, for she was ignorant of the sorrow of parting, and did not know that going to the capital was at all different from walking to the next village, which her father did very often. She ran to the side and caught hold of his long sleeve to keep him a moment. Father, I will be very good while I am waiting for you to come back, so please bring me a present. As the father turned to take a, a last look at his weeping wife and smiling, eager child, he felt as if someone were pulling him back by the hair. So hard was it for him to leave them behind, for they had never been separated before. But he knew that he must go, for the call was imperative. With a great effort, he ceased to think, and resolutely turning away, he went quickly down the little garden and out through the gate. His wife, catching up the child in her arms, ran as far as the gate and watched him as he went down to the road between the pines till he was lost in the haze of the distance and all she could see was his quaint, peaked hat and at last that vanished too. Now father has gone, you and I must take care of everything till he comes back, said the mother as she made her way back to the house. Yes, I will be very good, said the child, nodding her head. And when father comes home, please tell him how good I've been and then perhaps he will give me a present. Father, I'm sure, Father is sure to bring you something that you want very much. I know, for I asked him to bring you a doll. You must think of Father every day and pray for a safe journey till he comes back. Oh yes, when he comes home again, how happy I shall be, said the child, clapping her hands and her face growing bright with joy at the glad thought. It seemed to the mother, as she looked at the child's face, that her love for her grew deeper and deeper. Then she set to work to make the winter clothes for the three of them. She set up her simple wooden spinning wheel and spun the thread before she began to weave the stuffs. In the intervals of her work, she directed the little girl's games and taught her to read the old stories of her country. Thus did the wife find consolation in work during the lonely days of her husband's absence. While the time was thus slipping quickly by in the quiet home, the husband finished his business and returned. It would have been difficult for anyone who did not know the man well to recognize him. 
He had traveled day after day, exposed to all wealth, all weathers for about a month altogether, and was sunburned to bronze. But his fond wife and child knew him at a glance, and flew to him from either side, each catching hold of one of his sleeves in their eager greeting. Both the man and his wife rejoiced to find each other well. It seemed a very long time to all till the mother and child helping, his straw sandals were untied. His large umbrella had taken off, and he was again in their amidst in their old familiar sitting room that had been so empty while he was away. As soon as they had sat down on the white mats, the father opened a bamboo basket that he had brought in with him and took out a beautiful doll and a lacquer box full of cakes. Here, he said to the little girl, it is a present for you. It is a prize for taking care of mother in the house so well while I was away. Thank you, said the child, as she bowed her head down to the ground and then put out her hand just like a little maple leaf with its eagle, eager, widespread fingers to take the doll and the box, both of which, coming from the capital, were prettier than anything she had ever seen. No words can tell how delighted the little girl was. Her face seemed as if it would melt with joy, and she had no eyes and no thought for anything else. Again the husband dived into the basket, and brought out this time a square wooden box, carefully tied up with red and white string, and handing it to his wife said, And this is for you. The wife took the box, and opening it carefully took out a metal disc with a handle attached. One side was bright and shining like a crystal, and the other was covered with raised fingers, figures, raised figures of pine trees and storks, which had been carved out of its smooth surface in lifelike reality. Never had she seen such a thing in her life, for she had been born and bred in the rural province of Echigo. She glazed into the shining disc and looking up with surprise and wonder picture on her face said, I see somebody looking at me in this round thing. What is it that you have given me? The husband laughed and said, Why, it is your own face that you see. What I have brought you is called a mirror, and whoever looks into its clear surface can see their own form reflected here. Although there are none to be found in this out-of-the-way place, yet they have been in use in the capital for the most ancient time, since the most ancient times. There the mirror is considered a very necessary requisite for women, for a woman to possess. There is an old proverb that, as the sword is the soul of a samurai, so is the mirror of the soul of a woman. And according to popular tradition, a woman's mirror is an index to her own heart. If she keeps it bright and clear, so is her heart pure and good. It is also one of the treasures treasures that form the insignia of the emperor, so you must lay great store by your mirror and use it carefully. The wife listened to all her husband told her and was pleased at learning so much that was new to her. She was still more pleased at the precious gift, his token of remembrance while he had been away. If the mirror represents my, my soul, it's like a tongue twister, if the mirror represents my soul, I shall certainly treasure it as a valuable possession and never will I use it carelessly. Saying so, she lifted as high as her forehead in grateful acknowledgement of the gift and then shut it up in its box and put it away. The wife saw that her husband was very tired and sat above serving the evening meal and making everything as comfortable as she could for him. It seemed to the little family <clears throat> as if they had not known what true happiness was before. So glad were they to be together again. And this evening the father had much to tell of his journey and of all he had seen at the great capital. Time passed away in the peaceful home, and the parents saw their fondest hopes realized as their daughter grew from childhood into a beautiful girl of sixteen. As a gem of priceless value is held in its proud owner's hand, so had they reared her with unceasing loving care. And now their pains were more than dub doubly rewarded. rewarded. What a comfort she was to her mother as she went about the house taking her part in the housekeeping and how proud her father was of her for she daily reminded him of her mother when he had first married her but alas in this world nothing lasts forever even the moon is not always perfect in shape but loses its roundness with time and flowers bloom and then fade so at last the happiness of the family was broken up by a great sorrow the good and gentle wife and mother was one day taken ill in the first days of her illness the father and daughter thought it was only a cold and were not particularly anxious, but the days went by and still the mother did not get better. She only grew worse, and the doctors were puzzled, for in spite of all he did, the poor woman grew weaker day by day. The father and daughter were stricken with grief, and day or night the girl never left her mother's side. 
but in spite of all the efforts, the woman's life was not to be saved. One day, as a girl sat near her mother's bed, <clears throat> trying to hide with a cheery smile the gnawing trouble at her heart, the mother roused herself and, taking her daughter's hand, gazed earnestly and lovingly into her eyes. Her breath was labored, and she spoke with difficulty. My daughter, I am sure that nothing can save me now. When I am dead, promise me to take care of your dear father and try to be a good and dutiful woman. Oh, mother, said the girl as the tears rushed on her eyes, you must not say such things. All you have to do is make haste and get well. That will bring the greatest happiness to father and myself. Yes, I know, and it is a comfort to me in my last days to know how greatly you long for me to get better, but it is not to be. Do not look so sorrowful, for it was so ordained in my previous state of existence that I should die in this life just at this time, knowing this. <clears throat> I am quite re resigned to my fate, and now I have something to give you whereby to remember me when I am gone. Putting her hand out, she took from, from the side of the pillow a square wooden box tied up with a silken cord and tassels. Undoing this very carefully, she took out the box of the mirror that her husband had given her years ago. <clears throat> when you were still a little child, your father went up to the capital and brought me back a present. It is called a mirror. This I give you before I die. If, after I have ceased to be in this life, you are lonely and long to see me sometimes, then take out this mirror, and in the clear and shining surface you will always see me. So will you be able to meet me often and tell me all your heart. And though I shall not be able to speak, I shall understand and sympathize with you, whatever may happen to you in the future. With these words, the dying woman handed the mirror to her daughter. The mind of the good mother seemed to be now at rest, <clears throat> and sinking back without another word, her spirit passed quietly away that day. The bereaved father and daughter, <clears throat> the bereaved father and daughter were wild with grief, and they abandoned themselves to their bitter sorrow. They felt it to be impossible. Uh, they felt it to be impossible. <clears throat> They felt it to be impossible to take leave of the loved woman who till now had filled their whole lives and had to and to commit her body to the earth. But this frantic burst of grief passed, and they took possession of their own hearts again, crushed though they were in resignation. In spite uh, In spite of this, the daughter's life seemed to her desolate. Her love for her dead mother did not grow less with time, and so keen was her remembrance that everything in daily life, even the falling of the rain and the blowing of the wind, reminded her of her mother's death and of all that they had loved and shared together. One day when her father was out and she was fulfilling her household duties alone, her loneliness and sorrow seemed more than she could bear. She threw herself down in her mother's room and wept as if her heart would break. Poor child, she longed just for one glimpse of her of the loved face, for one sound of the voice calling her pet name, or for one moment's forgetfulness of the aching void in her heart. Suddenly she sat up. Her mother's last words had rung through her memory. Oh, my mother told me when she gave me the mirror as a parting gift that whenever I looked into it I shall be able to meet her, to see her. I had nearly forgotten her last words, how stupid I am. I will get the mirror now and see if it can possibly be true. She dried her eyes quickly. <clears throat> She dried her eyes quickly, and going to the cupboard, took out the box that contained the mirror, her heart beating with expectation as she lifted the mirror out and gazed into its smooth base. Behold, her mother's words were true. In the round mirror before her saw her mother's face, but, oh, the joyful surprise. It was not her mother, thin and wasted by illness, but the young and beautiful woman as she remembered her far back in the days of her own earliest childhood. It seemed to the girl that the face in the mirror must soon speak although she heard the voice of her mother telling her again to grow up a good woman and a dutiful daughter, so earnestly did the eyes in the mirrors look back into her own. It is certainly my mother's soul that I see. She knows how miserable I am without her, and she has come to comfort me. Whenever I long to see her, she will meet me here. How grateful I ought to be. And from this time the weight of sorrow was greatly lined to her young heart. Every morning to gather strength for the day's duties before her, <clears throat> And every evening, for consolation before she lay down to rest, did the young girl take out the mirror and gaze at the reflection, which, in the simplicity of her earnest, innocent heart, she believed to be her mother's soul. Daily she grew in the likeness of her dead mother's character, and was gentle and kind to all.
to all, sorry, and a dutiful daughter to her father. A year spent in the morning, in mourning, had thus passed away in the little household when, by the advice of his relations, the man married again, and the daughter now found herself under the authority of a stepmother. It was a trying position, but her days spent in the recollection of her own beloved mother and of trying to be what the mother wished her to be. I made the young girl docile and patient, and now she determined to be final, filial, and dutiful to her father's wife in all respects. Everything went on apparently smoothly in the family for some time under the new regime. There were no winds or waves of discord to ruffle the surface of everyday life, and the father was content. But it is a woman's danger to be petty and mean, and stepmothers are proverbial all the world over, and this one's heart was not at her first smiles were, as her first smiles were. As the days and weeks grew into months, the stepmother began to treat the motherless girl unkindly and to try and come between the father and child. Sometimes she went to her husband and complained of her stepdaughter's behavior, but the father, knowing that this was to be expected, took no notice of her ill-natured complaints. Instead of lessening his affection for his daughter, as a woman desired, her grumblings only made him see, only made him think of her the more. The woman soon saw that he began to show more concern for his lonely child than before. This did not please her at all, and she began to turn over in her mind how she could, by some means or other, drive her stepchild out of the house. So crooked did the woman's heart become. She watched the girl carefully, and one day, peeping into her room in the, clear, in the early mornings, she thought she discovered a grave enough sin to which to accuse the child of her father. The woman herself was a little frightened, too, at what she had seen. So she went at once to her husband, and wiping away some false tears, she said in a sad voice, Please give me permission to leave, leave you today. The man was completely <clears throat> taken by surprise at the, sudden, at the suddenness of her request and wondered what had ever happened. Uh, do you find it so disagreeable, he asked, in my house that you can stay no longer? No, no, it has nothing to do with you. Even in my dreams, I have never thought that I wish to leave your side. But if I go on living here, I am in danger of losing my life. So I think it is best for all concerned that you should allow me to leave. And the woman began to weep afresh. <clears throat> her husband, distressed to see her so unhappy, and thinking that he could not have her have heard all right, said, Tell me what you mean. How is your life in danger here? I will tell you since you ask me. Your daughter dislikes me as her stepmother. For some time past, she has shut herself in her room morning and evening, and looking in as I pass by, I am convinced that she has made an image of me and is trying to kill me by magic art, cursing me daily. It is not safe for me to stay here, such being the case. Indeed, indeed, I must go away. We cannot live under the same roof any more. The husband listened to the dreadful tale, but he could not believe his gentle daughter guilty of such an evil act. He knew that by popular superstition people believe that one person could cause a gradual death of another by making an image of the hated one and cursing it daily. But where had, this, where had his young daughter learned such knowledge? The thing was impossible, yet he remembered having noticed that his daughter stayed much in her room of late and kept herself, and kept herself away from everyone even when visitors came to the house. Putting this fact together with his wife's alarm, he thought that there might be something to account for the strange story. His heart was torn between doubting his wife and trusting his child, and he knew not what to do. He decided to go at once to his daughter and try to find out the truth. Comforting his wife and assuring her that her fears were groundless, he glided quietly to his daughter's room. The girl had for a long time past been very unhappy, she had tried by amiability and obedience to show her goodwill and to mollify the new wife and to break down that wall of prejudice and misunderstanding that she knew generally stood between step-parents and their stepchildren. But she soon found that her efforts were in vain. The stepmother never trusted her and seemed to misinterpret all her actions, and the poor child knew very well that she often carried unkind and untrue tales to her father. She could not help comparing her present unhappy conditions with the time when her own mother was alive only a little more than a year ago. <clears throat> so great a change in this short time. Mornings and evenings she wept over her rem over the, the remembrance. Whenever she could, she went to her room and sliding the screens too, took out the mirror and gazed as she thought at her mother's face. It was only comfort. It was the only comfort she had in these wretched days. 
Her father found her occupied in this way, pushing aside the Fusama. He saw her bending over something or other very intently, looking over her shoulder to see who was entering the room. The girl was surprised to see her father, for he generally sent for her when he wished to speak to her. She was also confused at being found looking at the mirror, for she had never told anyone of her mother's last promise, but had kept it as a sacred secret of the heart. So before turning to her father, she slipped the mirror into her long sleeve. Her father, noting her confusion and her act of hiding something, said in a severe manner, Daughter, what are you doing here? And what is it that you have hidden in your sleeve? The girl was frightened by her father's severity. Never had he spoken to her in such a tone. Her confusion changed to apprehension, her color from scarlet to white. She sat down and shamefully, unable to reply. Appearances were certainly against her. The young girl looked guilty, and the father, thinking that perhaps after all his wife had told was true, spoke angrily. Then is it really true that you are daily cursing your stepmother and praying for her death? Have you forgotten what I told you, that although she is your stepmother, you must be obedient and loyal to her? And the father's eyes filled with sudden tears to think that he should have to upbraid his daughter in this way. She, on her part, did not know what he meant, for she had never heard of the superstition that by praying over an image it is possible to cause the death of a hated person. But she saw that she must speak and clear herself somehow. She loved her father dearly and could not bear the idea of his anger. She put out her hand on his knee uh, deprecatingly. Father, do not say such dreadful things to me. I am still your obedient child indeed. I am, however... Oh, however stupid I may be, I should never be able to curse anyone who belongs to you, much less praying for the death of one you love. Surely someone has been telling you lies, and you are dazed and you know not what you say, or some evil spirit is taking possession of your heart. As for me, I do not know. No, not so much as a dewdrop of the evil thing to which you accuse me. But the father remembered that she had hidden something away when he first entered the room, and even his earnest protest did not satisfy him. Then why are you always alone in your room these days? And tell me what is it that you have hidden your sleeve? Show it to me at once. The daughter, though, shyly, shy of confessing how she had cherished her mother's memory, saw that she must tell her father all in order to clarify, in order to clear herself. Oh, sorry. So she slipped in the mirror out from her long sleeve and laid it before him. This, she said, is what you saw me looking at just now. Why? He said in great surprise. This is the mirror that I bought that I brought as a gift to your mother when I went up to the capital many years ago. And so you have kept it all this time. Now why do you spend so much of your time before this mirror? Then she told then she told him of her mother's last words and of how she had promised to meet her child whenever she looked into the glass. But still the father could not understand the simplicity of his daughter of his daughter's character in not knowing that what she saw was herself reflected in the mirror. And was not her mother. What do you mean, he asked. I do not understand how you can meet the soul of your lost mother by looking in this mirror. It is indeed true, said the girl. And if you don't believe what I say, look for yourself. And she placed the mirror before her. Then looking back from the smooth metal disc was her own sweet face. She pointed to the reflection seriously. Do you doubt me still? She asked earnestly, looking up into his face. With an exclamation of sudden understanding, the father smote his two hands together. How stupid I am. At last I understand. Your face is as like your mother's as the two sides of a melon. Of a melon. Thus you have looked at the reflection of your own face all this time, thinking that you were brought face to face with your lost mother. You are truly a faithful child. It seems at first a stupid thing to have done, but it is not really so. It shows how deep has been your filial piety, piety and how innocent your heart. Living in constant remembrance of your lost mother has helped you to grow like her in character. How clever it was of her to tell you to do this. I admire and respect you, my daughter, and I am ashamed to think that for one instant I believed your superstitious stepmother's story and suspected you of evil and came with his intention of scolding you severely. I beg you to forgive me. And here the father wept. He thought of how lonely the poor girl must have been and of all that she must have suffered under her stepmother's treatment. His daughter, steadfastly keeping his keeping her faith and simplicity in the midst of such adverse circumstances, bearing all her troubles with so much patience and amiability, made him compare her to the lotus, which rears its blossom of dazzling, be dazzling beauty out of the slime and mud of the moats and ponds, 
fitting emblem, emblem of a heart which keeps itself unsullied while passing through the world. The stepmother, anxious to know what would happen, had all the, this while been standing outside the room. She had grown interested, and had gradually pushed the sliding screen back till she could see all that went on. At this moment, she suddenly entered the room, and dropping to the mats, she bowed her head over her widespread, her outspread hands before her stepdaughter. I am ashamed, she exclaimed in broken tones. I did not know what a filial child you were. Through no fault of yours, but with a stepmother's jealous heart, I have disliked you all the time. Hating you so much myself, it was but natural that I should think your reciprocity, you re you reciprocated the feeling. And thus, <clears throat> when I saw you retire so often to your room, I followed you. And when I saw you gaze daily into the mirror for long intervals, I concluded that you had found out how I disliked you and that you were out for revenge, trying to take my life by magic art. As long as I live, I shall never forget the wrong I have done to you in misjudging you and in causing your father to suspect you. Uh, thus did the unkind stepmother humble herself and ask forgiveness of the girl she had so wronged. Such was the sweetness of the girl's disposition that she willingly forgave her stepmother and never bore a sin or moment's resentment of malice towards her afterwards. The father saw by his wife's face that she had she was truly sorry for, his, for the past and was greatly relieved to see the terrible misunderstanding wiped out of the remembrance of by both the wrongdoers. By both the wrongdoer and the wronged. From this time on, the three lived together as happy as fish in the water, no such trouble ever darkened the home again, and the young girl gradually forgot a year of unhappiness in the tender love and care that her stepmother now bestowed upon her. Her patience and goodness was rewarded at last. And that's the end of that little short story. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you want me to read more, I think there are like five or six more uh, in this series um, that I'd be happy to read. Just uh, let me know. You can email the show, hello at Sleep and Relax ASMR. You can check out our website, sleepandrelaxasmr.com. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks as always for listening, and take care.